Welcome to ANN in depth. In our last episode, we talked to Sylvia about the general conference session planning, the 10 years it takes to come to a general conference session. In this podcast episode, we're going to talk about the executive committee and other world meetings that happen every year. And Sylvia's back to help us understand how that works. Sylvia, welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here again. Every spring and every fall or autumn, we have a special meeting of the executive committee right here at the general conference building. And we want to understand what the executive committee is and why is it that everybody travels here? So as far as I understand, and you correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> in between sessions, there are five years and a lot happens within five years. So we need a representative body from around the world that will make decisions during those five years that will help the church move forward. The executive committee is that body that meets twice a year to make those decisions. And what does that mean in, in, in practical terms? In the past, we came together as an executive committee, those twice a year, and there was no hybrid at all. Then we started broadcasting what was happening so that everyone could watch it full transparency to the whole world. Then we started offering the option to have a hybrid where people can watch and vote from different parts of mm -hmm. the world. So tell me more about if I'm right in my description of what the executive committee is, and then we can talk about what it takes to organize these meetings. So yes, um, before pandemic, things were happening differently we all know that um so there was no live streaming if i remember correctly before pandemic we started in 2016 oh 2016 17, okay streaming. i'm sorry i'm so sorry not, not the hybrid so people couldn't vote but we right. would just stream on yes, youtube stream, to everyone. yes um but then pandemic hit and what do we do so we had to come up with another plan um the first spring meeting and the first annual council were only on Zoom in during 2020. So it wasn't hybrid. It was online only. Exactly. It was hmm. online only. Then in 2021, uh, spring meeting was still on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And for annual council, we only brought the division officers to attend in person. And the rest of the executive committee joined on Zoom. So, well, we'll talk about the logistics later. No, yes. let's let's dive into it. Let's <laughs> All right. let's dive into it. What does it take to now bring people together? Because now we're encouraging people to come. Yes. At least for annual council. Yes. Everyone yeah. like before. Yes. But if they cannot attend for whatever reason, there is also the option of joining online or not. Well, for annual council this year, so in twenty twenty one we only brought the division officers, right? And last year in twenty twenty two was after GC session was the very first time that we brought everyone here mm -hmm. for annual council, like all the executive committee uh, members. Right. Now, there were a handful that could not make it, and so they joined on Zoom. Um, but this year, in 2023, everyone was supposed to attend in person, and right. those who couldn't come, they were watching online but they couldn't vote because it only took place right so it wasn't yes. hybrid yes it was back to what we yes. had before the pandemic which Correct. was they could watch it but if they wanted to participate yes then make their way here but spring meeting it's a it's different for spring meeting only the division officers come here and the rest of the executive committee were on zoom and will be on zoom as well next year okay so that one will be hybrid. Nice. Nice. Bigger participation. Okay. What does it take to get visas for all these people so many times? Do they do that themselves? What's the process of, of making sure everybody's here? So um, the process has changed after pandemic, of course. Um, the State Department, the U.S. State Department has a list, uh, a wait list. It shows you per city you know, within a country, um, how many days it takes to make an appointment 
uh, with the embassy to get a visa. So it, in some cases, there's like over 500 days of wait to Ouch. make an appointment. That's a very, that's over a year. I mean, a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. That is a very long time. So um, when the executive committee knows a uh, person, right, knows that they have to come here or they have to attend any of the big meetings, um, they send us a request. They send a request to our office to uh, request a letter of invitation. So our office will write a letter of invita invitation explaining a little bit about the event. And then we send that and they present that letter uh, when they go for the interview. Uh, and they use the same letter as they come into the United States. When okay. Travel here. For many of these officers, it, it is their first time coming to the United States, and for some of them, it's the first time they travel internationally. Yes. Um, maybe they've been elected as a union president, mm -hmm. and they're not used to it. And I remember talking to the team some time ago how difficult it is to even pick people up at the airport. Yeah. Because in the form, uh, I remember one of them writing, you know, what's your flight number? Boeing 777. Yes. You know, as a, as a flight number. They're yes. not used to the nomenclature of traveling, but we need to cater for them and we need yeah. to help them. Yes. No one is born with that knowledge and we need to slowly help them. How is it bringing hundreds of people from the airport when they come every year? Tell me more about that logistic. Well, for this year, uh, we decided to do something different. Because, uh, as you mentioned, for some of them, it is the first time on a plane, first time out of their country, first time flying into the United States, first time perhaps speaking English, right? And so we decided to send uh, two ambassadors, that's what, uh, welcoming ambassadors, that's what we called, our office called that. Huh. Um, welcoming ambassadors to one of the airports. So we had two of our staff uh, go to the airport to the international arrivals, and they would welcome the members with a big sign. Uh, that had that's the beautiful. SDA, yes. That's had the beautiful. SDA uh, sign with the name of the person arriving, and uh, we would welcome them and then call the vehicle that was picking them up. Um, and so we tried to facilitate as much as possible the arrival. And we actually wow. good, um, got very good feedback. I'm on sure that. people yes. feel like they are valued. So we are going to add yeah. uh, more airports for n next year. And of course, we will do the same thing. Wow. Okay. Then they come here. And what hotels do they stay? Is the how many people are we talking about? First of all, that come from abroad. Is it because it's not thousands, so it's hundreds this time. Yeah, it's, GC uh, session will be thousands. But. I would say probably two hundred and fifty between two hundred and two hundred and fifty. Um, it's not a big number, but you still have to bring the bring them from the airport to the hotel. You need to find a place to sleep. Uh, for over a week and you also have to feed the entire executive committee yes yeah so uh, typically we have about three hotels uh, because you know hotels have let's say a hotel our hotel here across uh, the general conference building um, one of them has a hundred and 15 rooms, 120 rooms. But when you make contracts with a hotel, they cannot give you all, the all rooms. 120 uh, sure. rooms. So they have to keep some for um, their corporate yeah. um, officials and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have a limit. We try to contract as many as possible, but we have a limit. So that's why we typically have three, four hotels. Okay. Uh, for the annual council, and uh, a few, le uh, a few, uh, just a few rooms for spring meeting. Okay. Um, so we contract the hotels, and then we have uh, to also contract a transportation company to shuttle everyone here in the morning um, with the traffic. So we need to start the process very early in the morning. They need to eat breakfast, of course, and then we need to bus them into the general conference building. So because of the traffic in Washington, this area, actually, um, we, the, the buses loop, the shuttles loop for about two hours, uh, to pick everyone up. Wow. 
there are a thousand details that you need to think of for each of these meetings. There's also translation to contend with and all sorts of things. That made me wonder, when you were little Sylvia in primary school, were you always very organized? Is that how God made you or not? Or that's a learned skill later on? I, uh, believe it or not, I always liked to, uh, when I was playing, you know, when I was little, I would just organize things in a certain way. I knew it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. Even yeah. my, my crayons were organized in colors. <laughs> Color shades. <laughs> God was preparing you for this. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Sylvia, tell me about the, the reason why we don't have general conference sessions or executive committee meetings in other countries. We're an international church. We're not an American church only. Correct. Although we started in America. Why is it that we... Let's start with GC session. Why don't we have GC session in other countries? It's expensive because we do several site visits. And uh, when you think about the large facility that you need to have to host... 60,000. Um, it's hard to find and also accommodations. I mean, you may find a, a city around the world that has a big convention center or a big dome, but what about hotels, right? Uh, you cannot be having a hotel uh, that people would have to travel 45 minutes every morning, Right, because yeah. uh, there you're talking about, as you said, the the um, delegates are over two thousand, so it's it's not easy. Well, and finding all of that together, I I cannot think of anywhere in the world that has a stadium, or a dome, or, but a stadium, mm -hmm. and a large convention center attached, yeah, adjacent, a, yeah, right next to yeah. it, because many cities have both. Yes, not all, but many cities have both, but they're not next to each other. Yeah. And then you have the hotel. So basically, the legit, many American cities were built for this, for this kind of event. Yes. So that makes sense. What about annual council? We used to have annual council in other parts of the world. I remember conversations about an annual council in the Philippines and yeah. another one in, I think it was Brazil somewhere. Yes. I, don't, I don't remember. I, I wasn't so. here. Yeah. But why is it that we prefer here? Is it the... It's less work for the organization because it would be, it, you know, you're, you'll get used to the same process yeah. and so on. Is it that people like coming to the headquarters, you know, a couple of times a year or once a year for the officers, for, for others? Tell me more. Why, why is, is it that it's more difficult in other parts of the world? It's the things that you just mentioned. And I would say that... Um, it's not that easy to travel to other countries sometimes. Uh, visas are not as easy as they used to be. Um, and uh, it's expensive to fly these days. So flight connections and so on. Yes. The, the more availability yeah. to a place to... And then we need to take... Easier it is. Yes, that's right. And then you need, you need we need to take a lot of things from here. We would have to, you know, carry that wherever we go. Yeah. So it's a lot cheaper and more efficient to have it here. Is yes. Yes. Essentially it. Yes. And less resources to plan it. Correct. You also helped uh, this year to organize this thing called ATS. Tell me more about that. So ATS was Adventist, was the Adventist, the first summit that we did on Adventist technology. And we went to Brazil Sao Paulo, actually. Woohoo! Woo yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got to drive uh, for the first time in Brazil. So Is that, that right? was fun. Yes. <laughs> all right. Did you, get, did you crash or was it nope. okay? No, no, no. Look at that. Yes. Safe and I sound. I did well. <laughs> Safe and sound. <laughs> um, so we did that in June of this year, as you mentioned. And we brought 100 people from around the world. These were... Uh, IT directors from the divisions and some of the unions. And um, we had a great time. We had a week of presentations, plenary sessions, and also uh, workshops. 
Fantastic. G uh, Division Treasurers also came, which was very interesting to see them there. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Next year, uh, in July, we'll be in Thailand. Is that correct? That is correct. Chiang and Mai. I know this because we are organizing GAIN, the Global Adventist Internet Network, uh, which is the communication and technicians and administrators, pastors, etc. will be uh, around the same time, will be connected. And also the uh, Hope Channel's uh, leadership conference will be there. That is so this is the, the, the place where we will study and struggle together with artificial intelligence for mission and technology for mission and how we can use every tool available in the digital world for mission. And it will be a, a, a really meaningful event, especially because we need all of that technology to finish our mission. How are the planning? How are the plans going, and what is involved in an international, you know, plan like this? We're working on the contract, hoping to finalize because now we have three different meetings that will gather at the same pla uh, same place, mm -hmm. and we start with ATS the first part of the week, then we go into gain, and then uh, the following week will be Hope Channel uh, meeting, and um, so it's is uh, planning an international event it's a little bit different because you don't know if you are not able to do a site visit previously you get there for the first time and you realize okay now going to the air from the airport to the venue this is what's happening um, this is what's around the venue that you were not expecting so um that's the difference, I guess, between being in the U.S. where it's easy to plan for a meeting. You can do site visits um, and so on. So, But we are very excited that we'll be able to be at that convention center uh, and the hotel is right next to it. So um, I look forward to working with all of you. Excellent. Well, Sylvia, do you have any more comments or thoughts about meetings in general and, and the important the ministry behind organizing these meetings? For me, the ministry is getting to know um, the department that is asking, for example, to uh, help them organize a meeting. It's great to partner together. And it's great to uh, do it for a cause, a great cause that is the mission of the church. So we can finish the mission of the church. And it's great to uh, work with other colleagues from around the world. And um, it's, it's also very fulfilling to listen, listen to the songs and the devotionals, um, that we get to experience when we do these meetings. And also when you think about the business part of, of these meetings, right? When, when we gather, it's, um, it's very good. I mean, we work for in a great church, in a great place. Yeah, and any one of these meetings can be transformative in a leader's life, yes. setting them in a different course. And the Holy Spirit uses these meetings to transform us. Yes. Sylvia, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be here again. And thank you for listening to this episode of ANN in Depth, where we talk to Sylvia about the meetings of the Adventist Church, the world meetings of the Executive Committee, and technology and others. We hope that you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please consider subscribing. And if you're listening in other platforms, please follow this podcast. If you have questions for Sylvia, uh, don't hesitate to ask those questions on the YouTube chat and we will read every comment and respond to you. Again, thank you for listening.